A warm welcome to all our viewers, to our series Natural Medicine. Today we want to learn about something that accompanies us every day, namely the 12,000 liters of air that you and I breathe in every day. What does it really consist of? What is in it and in what constellation is it healthy and where is it unhealthy and how could we make air even more compatible for us in order to produce even more energy from it? I would like to look at this topic today. I'm also a bit confused. I did some googling and read things here that I think are totally contradictory. That's why I took the liberty of inviting an expert who has been working on the subject of air with his company for 22 years. And after the intro, we'll dive straight into this important topic. Stay tuned. Here we are again. And now I can also show and introduce my guest. Here he is, Mr. Guido Bierther. A very warm welcome, dear Guido. Thank you. Hello. Dear Alexander, thank you very much for taking the time to go through the questions with me. The first one already starts, Google literally says, the air consists of 99.96% nitrogen. One sentence further down it says it consists of only 78% oxygen, and nitrogen is toxic. And then it says nitrogen is not toxic. I don't understand anything anymore. Mathematically, that doesn't fit, 78% and 99.96%, that would be just over 100%. What always amazes me is that all these years we haven't read anything about the CO2 content, which has been talked about a lot and we've been informed about it in the media from morning to night, because this is only 0.04% of 100%. This brings us to a topic that has attracted a lot of attention, but ultimately only accounts for 0.04%. Incidentally, this also corresponds approximately to the proportion of hydrogen in the relative humidity, which is specified internationally as 0.038%. And we believe that the relative humidity is much more relevant than the CO2 content. And I think with 78% of nitrogen in the air, 21% oxygen and 1% noble gases. This includes 0.04% CO2 and 0.038% relative humidity. So this is included in the noble gases and I think much more attention needs to be paid to the relative humidity. Because we assume that the oxygen must cooperate with the relative humidity, we know that heating, air conditioning and so on dry out our mucous membranes. And this ultimately means that the oxygen cannot react as well in the body. So we assume that it must in any case make connections with the relative humidity. That reminds me of these hydrogen generators, where you enrich water with hydrogen and that also means that the body can drink a lot more energy with this water. Does this also mean that the higher the humidity in the air, the more hydrogen energy molecules I get into my body via my nose? Well, we did an experiment with Professor Roba back then. A room has been designed with a 21% oxygen content. It remained, but the relative humidity was reduced so that the test subjects could no longer stay in the room after several hours, even though there was oxygen in the room. This means that oxygen is one thing, but relative humidity is another. If we think back 20, 30 or 40 years, our grandparents still told for the heating that was still on the wall back then, so no underfloor heating, that containers needed to be attached to increase the relative humidity. Because my grandparents always said, the dry air will make you sick. And we see it the same way, because we also see the dry air as inert. And it has to be reactive in order to work in the body, so to build up energy. But I've also read time and again that such humidification systems are also a germ trap. Yes, of course, we are dealing with a very big issue here. 
I don't even want to think about air conditioning in rooms, of course. But again, the big thing is that if the immune system is strong enough, it can cope better with all kinds of irritations, viruses and bacteria. In principle, we can't change the air. We can only prepare or change ourselves so that we can simply deal better with bad air. Now you've chosen such a beautiful background image, the forest. Whenever I walk through the forest, I have the feeling that the air is better. Is it really better in the forest or is it just the relative humidity that makes me feel like I'm breathing better air? Well, I always say that air is not the same as air, just as wine is not the same as wine. And I believe there is much more going on in the forest or in the air than just oxygen, nitrogen, and the noble gases. I think it's a real recipe. We know that when we deal with forest air or forest issues in general, we know what terpenes are. These are the messenger substances of plants and trees. So there are all kinds of, I'll say, formulations that are much more than just oxygen and nitrogen, so to speak. I always say light, air and water is the key. Light, air and water, the interplay between them, must be in balance. We don't need more oxygen, we simply need to help the body or understand that we can optimally utilize the 21% oxygen present in the air. Hardly any of us know that as a young, healthy person we exhale around 17% or 75% of the oxygen we take in unused. With increasing age, lack of exercise, stress and illness, the body also loses its ability to utilize oxygen optimally. This makes it clear that we don't need more oxygen, but that we should make better use of the oxygen in the air. And we can support this with a visit to the forest, for example with forest bathing. There are all kinds of technical methods that can be used to support this. But basically, we don't need any more oxygen if we exhale 75% of the oxygen unused. That's the reason why life can be saved by mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. So if we had used up all the oxygen we were going to breathe out, then it would make almost no sense to support the patient with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. That's a great tip. Thank you very much. Incidentally, I also read that, also on Wikipedia, that often 4% is only consumed from the air we breathe. However, I have to say that I have also measured this in patients for years. Critically ill patients often have only 2% oxygen utilization, but were also completely lacking in energy, could hardly walk up the stairs. It all makes sense, because oxygen is an important component that has to be burned within the cell in order to produce ATP molecules. And I've seen the opposite with top athletes and people who have done altitude training, for example, or used modern technologies such as forest air. And they were actually able to train themselves to utilize more oxygen by breathing in this way and then immediately burned more fat. They lost weight and had more energy to repair their own construction sites. Right, altitude training is of course also an established technology or methodology when you go to high altitudes. It is ultimately a stimulation therapy. However, it is also often the case, and I have to mention this, that if less oxygen is offered, it naturally provokes the body to work towards this somewhere. But it's often the case that we've heard from a lot of athletes who used to do altitude training that they said, okay, but then it was often the case that they caught a cold or fell ill afterwards. Let's say there are other methods that might be more tolerable without causing this stress in principle, especially the danger. It is problematic for the athletes when they are training for a competition. And then they all of a sudden have a cold or are ill or basically have no energy. We believe that the best way to do this is to optimize the interaction between sunlight and chlorophyll, which takes place in the forest, based on the model of photosynthesis. 
And there are also technical possibilities that replicate this technologically. We'll come back to how you can bring the forest air into your home and use this feeling and this advantage in quiet atmospheres. But let's stick to the topic again, I think it's incredibly important, and nobody talks about air. And now let's summarize again, whether I burn 4% oxygen or 7% is a significant difference. And there are techniques, I've also seen this in people with yoga, little breathing, training where you breathe out, like Wim Hof, and wait to breathe in. These are workouts in which the body learns to burn more with less oxygen. And then I immediately increase ATP production. And I think that is something that is simply basic medicine. You have to talk about it. This is something that anyone can do at home. Practicing how to breathe correctly. I find it fascinating anyway that hardly anyone knows anything about the air we breathe. I mean, we all know that from the first breath to the last, we can't avoid it. We can't eat for three weeks, we can survive that if necessary. We can go three or four days without drinking if necessary, but three or four minutes without breathing and that's it. Then we have a problem forever. Then the first brain cells die. So, there is no alternative. We talk about all sorts of methods medically and therapeutically, all sorts of supplements, nutritional supplements and what else, but what about breathing air? We don't really understand that this is considered so insignificant from a therapeutic point of view, but ultimately also by us humans ourselves. Who knows anything about breathing air? They all learned at school what we have repeated several times today, 80% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% noble gases. But then that was it. Who knows that we only have 0.04% CO2 in the air? Who knows that we only have 0.038% relative humidity? These are the crucial things and you can optimize the efficiency of this breathing air. In other words, we may be familiar with this from car engines. In the past, you could turn one or two screws on the carburetor, turn it one quarter turn and then the vehicle ran completely differently. And that is nothing other than a mixture of air and gasoline in the relationship. And we just have, let me say, that oxygen-hydrogen or relative humidity ratio, that has to be right. And when the right light is added to this, which the sun gives us in nature or in the context of photosynthesis, then it is actually optimal. And we believe that the interplay between light, air and oxygen is the decisive factor. I believe that too. In my opinion, the significance of light in the air is ultimately unexplored. But I once spoke to a food inspector who told me that only vegetables that have been genetically modified, there's no more energy in it. And because the light is often missing and other things are still missing. But then I also believe that light plays a decisive role in the air. But let's go back to CO2. I read 0.03% or 0.04%, and when we exhale from our body we get 4.04%, so from 0.04% to 4.04%. So we really are a CO2 polluters, we humans. But nature, the trees, the plants need the CO2 again so that it can be converted back into oxygen. It's a fascinating cycle. I think in almost every greenhouse where we grow our healthy plants, additional CO2 generators are installed. Why? So we demonize, excuse the language, we don't see this CO2 as so problematic and I've also looked at ancient literature and it says that we used to be able to achieve tens of times more photosynthesis than we do today. Or CO2 production. And we at Energy and the scientists around us also say, wait a minute, the oxygen is always there, it's not produced in the forest, it's basically recharged like a battery. This also means that the interplay between light, air and oxygen seems to cause the air to be charged with energy. It is not the case that when we breathe in oxygen, it is then irrevocably used up. 
We believe that it is really comparable to a battery that you can inhale when charged, so a full battery, or just not charged. And there are also aspects that come into play, as Professor Roba told us, we breathe in 24 trillion water molecules every day, 24 trillion water molecules. This corresponds to a drinking volume via of about 150 milliliters to 200 milliliters daily. You have to think about that. And this water that we inhale is also relevant, perhaps even more relevant than breathing through the stomach. Professor Roba had always said at the time that the water molecules we breathe in must also be active. And he's talking about this EZ water, which Professor Pollock found. EZ, yes, the negative charges. And that is probably the decisive factor. And the EZ water, which describes and I'll use a metaphor here, if you imagine a drop, it is basically filled on the inside and has an outer skin like an apple. And the outer skin is probably the decisive factor, that it can form bonds, that it is reactive, that it in turn cooperates with the other water molecules. So I think the relative humidity is just as important as the oxygen or the oxygen content. And I think that's ideal in combination. We breathe two and a half thousand liters of pure oxygen by this calculation, we burn about 11,000 to 12,000 liters of air every day, of which 2,500 liters are pure oxygen. This is actually the largest mass that we actually need to live. So we say two liters of water or three liters of water a day. But we never talk about this air. It is much more relevant than everything else around us. Once again, we can go days without drinking or eating, we can survive that. After two, three or four minutes of not breathing, that's it. I would like to go back to the humidity. We have much, much more stuff in the air these days. I'm also talking about all the particulate matter pollution. Isn't it the case that the higher the humidity, the more these things are bound and settle on the floor and ultimately no longer touch us on the nose? Wouldn't that be an advantage if we really made sure that we had more humidity in a room so that the dirt would settle? So in the end it doesn't fall down straight away, but we would end up breathing it in. And that's how it is in in nature, too. All the fine dust that is discharged, let's put it mildly, it all binds in the air. And as far as I know, they bind to the humidity in the air and then fall to the ground. But not only do we then basically have them on the ground, but the ground in nature absorbs the water. This means that the fine dust or the contaminants also go into the soil, into the earth, into the groundwater. And at some point, this will lead back to this. So the bottom line is that we need to help the body to detoxify as well as possible. It needs energy for this. And if the body has energy and a strong immune system, then I think it can cope better with all kinds of environmental damage. But I can hardly imagine that we can't really protect ourselves, that we are no longer exposed to these fine particles. It is indeed as you say. Of course, the higher the humidity, the more fine dust and particles are carried to the ground. Yes, people are always talking about acid rain, dirty water, and air, if you look at the composition, nitrogen, oxygen, and a few noble gases, so where should the dirt be? But it's still there too. You see it as a concern within the air quality nowadays, or what have you seen from your research? Yes, everything is nothing without air, I can only say again and again. And we can't change the air. We can help people to cope better with polluted air. But how should we protect ourselves against it? We are exposed to stresses and strains that we didn't have 20 or 30 years ago. Today, people talk about all kinds of things falling out of airplane engines or airplane situations. They talk about barium, they talk about aluminum, I think it's called gotium. How do you protect yourself from this? 
I can only say that it makes sense to protect the body, to push the immune system, to support it without end. And of course, conscious breathing is another issue. Air quality is one thing, but another is how do we process the air. There are great respiratory therapists. You just mentioned the Wim Hof method and so on. But I can't think of a way to really protect myself from the dirty air at the moment. But there are ways of protecting the body or preparing it so that it is better protected. That's the only thing we can see at the moment. But apart from that, I think we've all done water tests and we can see what kind of dirty water you end up with when you do all kinds of technologies with the water. And we can change that to a certain extent. And I don't want to see what the air would look like if we could make it visible with these technologies, if there is such a thing. But I don't think that exists today. And therefore forest air, that's the best. We can also spend time in the mountains, which is also wonderful, or on the open sea. And otherwise, of course, we need to make sure that we are exposed to the city air, all the exhaust fumes from vehicles and that we get out into the forest for half an hour or an hour at the weekend or, ideally, in the evening or at least get out of these contaminated areas in order to be able to regenerate. All you need to do is breathe the right air and use the right technology. Abdominal breathing, breathing more deeply. There are experts around you who know this much better. In Switzerland, a health insurance company even pays for therapies at the Butico Association. They learn breathing techniques to burn more oxygen. But now we come back to the forest, because nowadays there are an incredible number of studies relating to the forest, conventional medical double-blind studies, mainly from Asia, which show how valuable it is to distress there, to absorb more oxygen, to be utilized and burned, increased ATP production and self-healing increases. And now I come to you, because you, dear Guido, have managed for 22 years to bring the forest air to all city dwellers, to all people who have no opportunities. To go into the forest, to breathe this air at home. And I'd like to hear a bit more about that. What did you do there? So we have a technological advancement of previous oxygen therapies. Now I'll start by saying what we don't do. We do not increase the oxygen, nor do we ionize. And we are not adding ozone, but have looked over nature's shoulder and been able to technologically recreate a crucial photosynthesis process. And that's what I've been saying all along, the interplay between light, air and water. And we've built the whole thing into equipment the size of a video recorder, or I don't even know what a video recorder you can compare it to today. And this device can be at home or at the doctor's surgery. It is used everywhere, in sport, for prevention and to maintain health. And finally, you sit on this device with a breathing mask and ideally breathe in the air that flows out via this device or via a breathing mask for about 20 minutes a day and breathe as usual. And this seems to be very vital, very lively air that stimulates all kinds of processes in the body and supports recovery. Athletes mainly take it for regeneration, because the athlete always says, I need strength. Sure, but first and foremost, if they have two or three outings a week, they have to regenerate well. So that's basically our technology. A further development of previous oxygen therapies, without giving additional oxygen, but having the 21% oxygen content, but activating the whole thing via our technology, that it is simply better converted into metabolic energy. And you can compare that a bit with cold and warm water. We all know cold and hot water, we have two glasses in front of us. We throw a sugar cube into one of the glasses, you shouldn't eat it, at least not white industrial sugar, but we all know the picture from coffee. So the sugar is put into the cold water, you can stir until the cows come home nothing really happens. If energy is added to the water, 
put a sugar cube in and stir with a spoon two, three, four or five times, the water molecules and sugar molecules have formed bonds. And that's exactly how it is with energy breathing air or normal air. Normal air is like cold water, so to speak, and when activated with energy technology, it is like warm water and can therefore form better connections in the body. And the whole thing should create energy from within. Because now the whole conversation has come full circle. You say light, air and water in combination, and that is exactly what you have actually developed within this device together with photosynthesis, so that you have these three components. So we tested it a few years ago with patients and then looked at the oxygen utilization. How does the patient react when breathing with the device? We measured this before and after and each time the oxygen utilization increased and I think that's just totally revolutionary. If the body has more energy because the cell is supplied with more oxygen and produces more ATP, the body is better able to heal itself. It's also logical, isn't it? That's right, exactly. Without increasing the oxygen. I have to emphasize that again and again. Yes, without increasing it, but it burns more and we have measured that. So the oxygen utilization then went up by 4, 5 or 5.5. Some people went much higher, but with cancer patients we usually had 2%. And when they were suddenly at 3%, they came and said, Mr. Glog, I'm better than ever, I can walk the stairs. I thought to myself, that's phenomenal. So that simply has a lot more effects than we realize. Without air, everything is nothing. And if we know that air is needed in every cell, the oxygen, although we don't think so oxygen heavy at energy, because as I said, the air we breathe is a kind of recipe and we don't talk about air or breathing air, we call it breathing atmosphere. Professor Jung, who headed the scientific advisory board for us for years, or 10 years, once said that if you want to treat the fish in the aquarium, first heal the water. Think about what that means when we put up with all kinds of measures. And then we go back into the atmosphere, which may be contaminated with toxins. So where does that lead? That's why we say always think about the air you breathe first or think about the air you breathe, because there is no alternative, it cannot be replaced. The air we breathe, you cannot say okay, like with vitamins, that you can vary something, there is simply no alternative. And if the ratio between the humidity, oxygen and light is right, the efficiency can be easily optimized and the effect in the body enhanced. From classic breathing air to living breathing air. I have two more questions, very briefly. This oxygen utilization optimization machine, is it not only for patients, but can it also be used preventively? So not only commercially for practices, but actually also for private individuals at home? So it's made for prevention, for precaution, and it's not exclusively for therapeutic purposes, because it's not a medical product. We have declared it a wellness product or a lifestyle product, even though thousands of doctors around the world use it. But ultimately we want to position it more like an air conditioning or heating system. This brings us back to the subject of air conditioning, which is at the expense of vitality and air. This takes moisture out of the air, we need the moisture just as much as the heating. So, this is basically a bridge between air conditioning and heating and it revitalizes the air we breathe. And if you do this for half an hour a day, or 20 minutes, depending on what you want to achieve, you have already done a lot for yourself and for your health or health maintenance. If a viewer now says, that all sounds totally reasonable and I would like to try it out before buying a pig in a poke, just want to give it a try. How long would this attempt have to be before they can really notice something? Of course we can't say that across the board, but we've dealt with all kinds of people over the 22 years. Some were very health conscious, some were nutrition conscious, others were exactly the opposite. There are athletes, and so on. I don't want to make a blanket statement. We always say when it does you good. 
because if you use this technology, this spirovitalization, as we call it, with the vitalizer, if you use it, the body ultimately changes. We know this, for example, in women who have reached the age of 40 or 45 and maybe had a stressful time, maybe raised two or three children, they then start to breathe and assume that this will get them fired up or energized. But what is energy? We always interpret it as, I have new energy, I must look like Popeye, so to speak, full of energy. But the body itself decides what it does with the energy. And if the body has construction sites to compensate for or repair, then the body says, well, now I finally have some energy and now I'm going to make sure that I get this or that back into balance. Great answer. Great. That means that some people get tired of it at first and some are totally psyched. This means you should always use it when it does you good. Of course. And for the first 15 or 20 years, I always breathed in the afternoon, basically vitalized, and wondered why I couldn't fall asleep well. Then at some point I breathed earlier and was actually tired in the evening, which meant I was getting hyped. If you get hyped, you should breathe in the morning or at midday, for example after your lunch break, when this classic biological bend occurs. But an overdose is not possible. You have to do it when it's good for you. And we don't want to prescribe it the way other preparations do, morning, noon and evening or whatever. We don't want to do that. The body gives you the answer in the end. If anyone wants to read a bit more about these spirovital concepts, is there a platform where people can read up on it? Yes, we have really great guides. The guidebook is a good place to start, you can also download it from the internet, as they say. What keeps us alive, so the guidebook, what keeps us alive? That is very superficial. It shows, for example, why the whale, the mammal, can utilize 90% of the oxygen compared to our measly 17%. This is a brochure that also shows where we detoxify, because we are all talking about supply today, but what about disposal? Who knows that we detoxify 70% via the lungs, 20% via the skin, and I think 7% via the bladder, and 3% via the intestines. So this is the one brochure that we recommend. And if you want to go deeper, for example if you want to learn more about CO2, relative humidity and EZ water, you can download the Little Atmos, the Little Atmos, that's what it's called, it's a very popular brochure. This is also read now by teachers, doctors, children, and parents. We have put a lot of effort into this and are happy to make it available to interested parties free of charge. Great, thank you very much Guido. Where can I find the brochures? Yes, www.declayneatmos.de is a website. You can download it as a PDF, but this information is also available at www.declayneatmos.de. Of course, it is also available on the manufacturer's website, but if you enter, the little Atmos, into Google, you will find it everywhere, as it is now available for download in all kinds of places. Great, I think it's cool that we still have a brochure to read up on a bit. Thank you very much, dear Guido, for explaining and answering my many questions and confusions. And now let's tell Google that the air does not consist of 99.96% nitrogen, but that this is an error on Google's part, but that it is significantly less, and of course I will do that. We help each other. On that note, goodbye again Guido. Thank you for your help. Thank you Alexander, all the best. And good air for you too. Have fun breathing and enjoy the walk through the forest. Really do it, because it really is so scientifically well documented that it is good for us all. It distresses, it revitalizes, it invigorates the whole body and you will feel that you have much more energy. Have fun with it. All the best, see you next time.